Well, Mike's um, given a little bit of a background on uh, actually putting the nutrients where they're required, but one of the other big issues is with the soil phosphorus, just how much of it is available to the plant and how do we determine how much is available to the plant? And that's becoming a major challenge. We need to sort of go back and have a quick look at just how phosphorus is applied to the plant root and then a little bit of uh, soil chemistry in terms of how that phosphorus gets into the solution. But the main reason, or the main uh, process that phosphorus gets to the root system is by the process of diffusion. Phosphorus applied by diffusion is firstly determined by the diffusion coefficient in the soil. So the, the diffusion coefficient in the soil is how fast does the phosphorus move from the soil to the root surface. And that's very much determined by the soil properties. And a lot of our grain soils are vertisols, the cracking clays. And so with a little bit of luck, the p-diffusion coefficient is probably reasonably constant across a lot of our grain soils. The next thing that governs the supply of phosphorus by diffusion is the concentration gradient. And this is extremely important because we've got phosphorus in the soil solution, we've got the root surface which is actually removing phosphorus from the soil solution, so reducing the concentration, and so we set up a concentration gradient between the soil and the root surface. And this is one of the most important um, factors which are controlling the amount of phosphorus that can arrive at the root surface by this process. The other one, and this is probably the major one, is the root surface area. The more root system we've got, the more root surface area we've got for taking phosphorus out of the soil solution. So for those three factors there, probably this is the most important one if we're going to put these on a rating. This would be the second most important one and this one is probably the least important for our grain cropping soils, especially the cracking clays. So let's just have a bit of a look at how phosphorus is distributed in the soil. We've got phosphorus here in the soil solution, which is the major supplier of phosphorus to the plant through the process of diffusion. And we have effectively three pools of phosphorus in the soil. We have absorbed phosphorus, which is phosphorus which is absorbed by iron and aluminium oxides in the soil. So it's very much related to the amount of clay of the soil and the uh, clay content in the soil and also the clay mineral in the soil. And then we can find out in a lot of our vertisols we have these two other very important pools. We have fertiliser reaction products, so every time we put some DAP or MAP on the soil we end up with some reaction products from that fertiliser. But many of our vertisol soils have large amounts of calcium phosphate minerals or apatites. And the process is that the phosphorus moves from these forms into the soil solution is different to this process up here of the absorption desorption. Most of our acidic soils, are, so on the east of the divide, this is the major soil, soil uh, process governing phosphorus in the soil solution. It's the absorption desorption processes. But for a lot of our vertisols, it's dissolution of precipitation reactions which are governing the solution phosphorus concentration. And so it's these processes here that we need to get a much better handle on if we, if we can understand the availability of phosphorus in these soils. To make the discussion a little bit easier, I've just turned these two pools reserve phosphorus. So the two soil pig tests that are currently used in the grain industry are the Colwell method, which is a bicarbonate extract, and the BSESP method, which is an acid extract which was originally developed for the sugar industry, but which is now being uh, recommended in the grains industry to try to get a measure of this reserve P. So what do these two soil tests take out? Here we've got our three pools of phosphorus, and our coal extractor obviously takes out any P that's in solution, but the coal extractor is also pretty efficient at knocking this phosphorus off the sorb surfaces and bringing that into solution. So when we do a coal P, we're effectively measuring the solution phosphorus concentration of the soil and also what I would call readily desorbable phosphorus. So those two forms of phosphate are obviously well available to the, to the plant. That's the Colwell method. The BSES method was originally uh, developed in the sugar industry because the sugar industry is based on acidic soils and the thinking was, well, if we're trying to measure the amount of available phosphorus in those sorts of soils, we should use an acid extract. 
So that's why the BSES method was used in the sugar industry. But when we apply the BSES method to a soil that's got these three different phosphorus pools in it, we find that the BSES method takes out the solution P and some of the desorbable P, but it also starts to dissolve some of these calcium phosphate minerals in the soil and some of the fertiliser reaction products. So the BSES P is different to the Cogwell P to the extent that it's starting to take out, dissolve some of these compounds which as I said before, undergo dissolution reactions to provide solution P, which can then be taken up by the plant. We need to keep coming back to this point though. It's this, this solution P concentration which is governing P availability. So we've got those three soil pools. Which one is providing most phosphorus into the soil solution? We only took a glasshouse trial. We used uh, 18 uh, soils from the, the grains producing area in Queensland, Wood, New South Wales. And we grew forage sorghum in pots and we kept harvesting the forage sorghum until the crop could no longer grow because it was phosphorus, extremely phosphorus deficient. We provided all the other nutrients such as nitrogen and potassium and sulphur. And so the plants, we kept harvesting the plants till they died from extreme phosphorus deficiency. We were then able to measure the amount of phosphorus which the plants were able to take up during that period of time and also measure the phosphorus concentration in the soil before and after the crop removal. We've got a graph here and what I've done is I've plotted the accumulated phosphorus uptake, so that's the amount of phosphorus the plant was able to get from the soil against the decrease in coal oil extractable P. You can see that many soils, those soils fell on a nice straight line indicated that in soils such as these, the almost the sole source of phosphorus to the plant we could account for through our coal would be extracted. But we had several soils down here. They had very low levels of coal oil extractable P. And for those levels of coal oil extract extractable P, we would be expected P uptakes around about this level here. But some of those soils were able to provide a lot more phosphorus to the plant even though the coal oil extractable peak figure was very low. And the numbers in those, that are, those numbers there on top of the dots are the BSES extractable peak. And you see that this soil up here, which had quite a high P uptake for that very low level of coal oil peak, it had 380 milligrams per kilogram of BSES P in it. So that BSES extractable peak is obviously providing some phosphorus for that plant to be able to take it up. But we had another soil down here with nearly 800 milligrams per kilogram of BSES extractable P, and the plant was not able to get as much P out of that soil as it was out of the soil that had the lower level of BSES extractable P. So it's a little bit of a nightmare, I guess, from a soil chemistry point of view, because while all of these soils had pretty high levels of BSES extractable P, we'd say, okay, some of that P should be available. There's no direct relationship between the extractability, or the availability, I should say, of that phosphorus and the BSES method. And so we've got a major challenge in terms of soil chemistry is we've got an extractant which is able to take out phosphorus and in many cases more phosphorus than the coal oil method. And we find some soils which have got very high levels of that extractable phosphorus in them. And certainly they behave better than if we were just looking at the coal oil P status of those soils. But the issue is we don't have a direct relationship between the BSES extractable P and the amount of phosphorus which is available to the plant. So why the differences in this reserve P? We used another approach to try to get a bit of an idea of exactly what was going on. You can use iron oxide strips and the iron oxide is a very good scavenger for phosphorus. So as soon as phosphorus comes into the soil solution, the iron oxide will grab it and precipitate it. And so you end up with the iron oxide strips acting like a continuous sink of phosphorus. So as soon as P dissolves and comes into the soil solution, the iron oxide grabs it and removes it from the solution. So it's a one-way street for the phosphorus. It's a complete system of trying to keep phosphorus dissolving from the soil minerals. And so I've got this sort of a process going on where our iron oxide strip is keeping this soil solution peak concentration virtually zero 
And because it's virtually zero, all of these forms of phosphorus start to dissolve. And when we looked at the results for some of the soils, we got a bit of a bit of a shock. Uh, the situation, as usual, is more complicated than what we thought. Here we've got the amount of phosphorus which is removed by the iron oxide strips. What we did here was we got our soil, shook it up with an iron oxide strip for 18 hours, took the strip out, put a fresh strip in, and just kept going like that. In this soil, the, uh, we went up to 50 iron oxide strips. So this, that particular soil was run over a period of about six or eight weeks. The scientist who was doing the work got a bit, a bit tired by that stage and decided to give it up. But the interesting thing is, it's not a smooth curve. We've got all these different breaks and different rates. And these gradients, this gradient here for instance, means that when we remove this amount of phosphorus from the soil, suddenly we've got into another phase of phosphorus in that soil where the solubility of that phase was quite high. And over the case of about four or five strips, we're able to remove a lot more phosphorus. And then we get into another phase of lower solubility. So within this soil, we seem to have a whole lot of different forms of phosphorus in this reserve pool. The crop, exhaustively cropped till the crop died from phosphate deficiency, got 46 milligrams per kilogram out of that soil. So the crop didn't see any of that phosphorus. When we look at our routine soil tests, we find the Colwell P was at 60 milligrams per kilogram of the same order as what the crop was able to get out of the soil before it died from phosphorus deficiency. The BSESP took out 123 milligrams per kilogram and if we assume that the BSESP takes out whatever phosphorus comes out by the cold oil method, then the difference there between the cold oil method and the BSES method is some of the reserve feed in the soil. Well, guess what? The crop didn't see any of that reserve feed. There's another extractive, which we call HCLP, which is a lot stronger acid than the BSESP. It was able to take out nearly 500 milligrams a kilogram from the soil, but again, the crop didn't see that. When we plot the whole 18 soils and we've got the, the blue bars and the P uptake, you can see the P uptake was pretty variable because we picked soils where the phosphorus supply in the soil was very low, but they had different levels of reserve P in them. But you can see that the Coldwell P, the contribution of Coldwell P to that total P uptake, the percentage contribution was quite high. So certainly the Coldwell method is taking out most of the phosphorus which the crop immediately sees. There were some soils though where very low levels of coal oil P, very low uptake also, but you can see that the coal oil P only made a very small contribution to the amount of P that was available to the plant. The rest of it was uh, estimated using the BSES method. So the take home message from that trial was that certainly the coal oil P is a good indicator of the phosphorus which is immediately available to the plant, but those BSES P reserves Sometimes they're good, sometimes they don't seem to be making much contribution at all to the amount of P available. Note that there's a difference here between the experimental work. In the glasshouse, we were growing the, the uh, plants in very small pots, so it's very restricted root volume. The mycorrhizal status of the plants, we were a bit unsure because we didn't measure it. But in the field, you'd have mycorrhizal plants, presumably, and you'd have an unrestricted soil volume. So in other words, a much larger area for the roots to be able to exploit to get phosphorus from. So how do we explain what's going on here? We can think of it as a couple of water tanks. We've got the Colwell P here and the BSESP both measuring this dissolvable P, that's the P on the soil surfaces, and we've got this big tank of reserve P. Our initial soil solution peak concentration, that's what drives the amount of phosphorus available to the plant, might be up here. With P removal by the crop, we might actually drop that soil solution peak concentration down to a lower level. 
that there is a level of soil solution P where the crop root cannot take up the phosphorus out of the soil solution. A crop can, or the root cannot lower the phosphorus concentration down to zero concentration. There's a threshold level below which the roots are unable to get the phosphorus concentration any lower. And so in this situation, that crop is not going to see any of this reserve peat. There's also a very small pipe, we think, that connects the reserve P tank into this desorbable P tank. But we think the diameter of that pipe is pretty low. So I don't think there's a very fast resupply of phosphorus into the desorbable tank from the reserve tank. The issue is, can we lower this threshold soil solution peak concentrations the roots can get the soil solution down to, to a lower level, to, re to actually access some of this reserve P. So any factor reducing the rooting depth volume will reduce the accessibility of reserve P. Mycorrhizal roots can certainly access more P than non-mycorrhizal roots, and the reserve P at best can only partially meet the P requirements. Obviously we're going to need to put in supplementary P addition to raise that soil solution P concentration. So if we've got our initial soil solution P concentration here in depleted soil, what happens when we add phosphorus fertiliser? Come in the top and so we will initially raise the soil solution P concentration so the crop ends up getting more phosphorus. The diameter of this pipe connecting the reserve P into this desorbable P tank is currently unknown but we suspect it's pretty small so the movement of reserve P back into the soil solution and into this desorbable P pool is probably very slow. The other issue that Mike raised it was if we put phosphorus into these depleted soils, is it going to be fixed or is it going to be available? And it certainly looks like it's going to stay available. We're able to recover at least 80%, certainly 60, 60 to 80 percent of the freshly applied phosphate, we're able to recover that in the coal well and the BSES extractants. So it's obviously still there in a form which the plant can probably get. And most of that was present in the coal well pin fraction. So as Mike indicated, the residual P value in these soils is very good. It's not like the red soils in the east of the divide where you put phosphorus on and it might get fixed um, and virtually unavailable to crop growth. It's not that way with these soils. So some take home messages. Coal well P is a good indicator of immediately available P. That's why it's recommended that the coal well P is used to decide whether you need to put on starter P or not. When BSES P is much higher than coal well P, then a variable proportion of this reserve P is slowly available. And Chris will probably have a bit of a, a crack at trying to come up with some critical BSES P ranges later, but good luck to him. Your name is on the paper. <laughs> At best we believe that this reserve P can only partially meet crop requirements. <coughs> when P fertiliser is added to P depleted soils, most of it enters into the coal or P fraction and is therefore available. And the bottom line is maximising the uptake of reserve P is going to depend on maximising the rooting depth. So healthy root systems, big rooting volume, maximum availability of the reserve P. Any factor which reduces the rooting depth, such as salinity, chloride, toxicity, waterlogging or whatever, is going to upset and reduce the amount of phosphorus which the crop can get from that reserve peak pool. Thank you. Thanks, Bill.